Hey juniors, uh, welcome to The Raven. We're going to be covering that today. Um, you know, a poem that has a lot of cultural significance and value, not one of my favorites, but I mean, it's got some really interesting points. Uh, we'll talk about one of the reasons it's not one of my favorites is I'm not a big fan of Poe. Uh, I don't like the type of literature this comes out of, and we're going to look at page 291 in your textbook. It's called Gothic Literature, and to be honest with you, this stuff just doesn't do it for me. Um, it feels like they're trying to be scary, but they're not. And uh, because really in books, fear comes more from irony and surprising things. It doesn't come from like creepy imagery, to be honest with you. At least I don't think it does. It doesn't work well. So what Poe did to some people is really exciting and interesting. Um, I think that, again, historically he has value like a lot of these early writers do because they were some of the you know, forefathers and uh, you know, the, the people who started all this type of writing. But to be honest with you, uh, it's really not the best, in my opinion. But let's look at it real quick. Well, from before we get started, let's look at page 291. We want to take a shot at looking at the um, uh, elements of Gothic literature. We're going to see how these show up in the Ravens. So we've got four, I think it's four, five, five main things, okay? First thing is a bleak or remote setting, okay? Um, that's not going to apply to this, except that it's going to be nighttime and in December. So the setting is kind of bleak, but it's not going to be the same as some of his short stories, which, you know, would definitely have much more bleak settings. Uh, second thing would be macabre or violent incidents. And again, we don't really have a violent incident here. Um, we do see a man slowly losing his mind. So that could kind of qualify. Uh, three, we'll get characters in psychological and or physical torment. We definitely have that in this section, so be on the lookout for it. Four, supernatural or otherworldly elements. The fact that we have a talking bird right away qualifies you there. And then five, it says strong language full of dangerous meaning. Uh, that's a weird phrase, but, you know, there is a lot of very poetic and strong language that has some words that definitely would have a dangerous connotation, okay? All right, so we're going to now skip ahead a few pages. We're not going to read The Fall of the House of Usher. I think that's just a lot to tackle right now. So let's just focus on an example of this kind of writing in a smaller setting, and that would be The Raven on page 312, okay? So uh, what we're dealing with here is a guy who has lost someone he loves, uh, a person named Lenore. I'm assuming she's dead by a couple of comments, although you could probably convince me otherwise. But we definitely get this image of her being dead as we're starting. And this man's dealing with the grief and loneliness of losing someone he loves. And we're going to see in this as he slowly goes crazy. All right, Not even slowly, he's, he just goes crazy. Okay, All right, so let's do this. The rhyme scheme and the rhythm of this is very, uh, very, you know, uh, what's the word here? It's not basic, because that's definitely not it. But it, it's, it's consistent. That's a good word for it. And um, it helps make this more song-like. And it make, it's what, part of what makes this poem so powerful, in my opinion. All right, so starting on two, 312. We get, Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Sorry about that. Always. Uh, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Now, we're going to have a very consistent rhythm and rhyme scheme throughout from here on. And I think that's one of the things that does make this a pretty cool poem. So the guy's laying there, and he hears a knocking, and he just assumes that someone come to visit. He says, ah, distinctly, I remember it was in a bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. So he's sitting there. We're getting, this is where we're going to get that kind of bleak imagery. We're going to know it's December. We know the fire's dying. We know it's midnight. So all of these images lead up to, you know, this is going to be kind of creepy, right? Okay. It says, in the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." So it's like he's scared as he gets up to answer the door, as we all would be at midnight, <laughs> okay? You know, who's knocking at my door at midnight? And he's sitting there just kind of repeating to himself, "'It's just a visitor. It's nothing to be scared of.'" All right. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer, sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came a-tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I open wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. So now again we get the very creepy image of he's opening this door, and he's looking out, and there's no one there. 
And that's terrifying. Uh, definitely a scary moment. All right? So as deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering and fearing, doubting, dreaming. Dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. Then I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Okay, so now are we dealing with a ghost? I mean, he, he's thinking that this person's spirit has come to visit him. Um, we're getting some of that, like that fifth thing on the Gothic literature about, you know, uh, poetic, like dangerous type of words. We get things like doubting, dreaming, dreams no mortal ever dared to dream, silence unbroken, stuff like that, which is, you know, definitely got a kind of creepy tinge to it. It says, back then to the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something that my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is in this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, then this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. So again, he comes back into his room and uh, is looking around trying to figure out what the noise is and figures, well, maybe it's just the wind. This is a very, like, this, this poem's very simple, okay? Uh, as far as, like, if I was having you paraphrase, I think you guys could do this with no trouble. Um, really, the, as far as the, the, the only issue with it is some of the wording, but, I mean, really, it's pretty much, it's pretty basic. Each stanza has one main thing occurring. <laughs> This is open here. I flung the. Uh, sorry, guys. Looks like. Give me two seconds. Gonna have a power issue with the computer, apparently. So, all right, we're back up and running. So let me get back to this. It says open here. I flung the shutter when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least a pool obeisance made he not a minute stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched on a, upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more so the bird comes in and there's a lot of language in there that's you know complex but then uh the bird comes in and it sits on the, it says a bust of palace palace is athena uh the greek goddess of wisdom so the bird comes in and hangs out sitting on top of her uh her skull there uh, her bust, but but bust is just the the head of a figure. So the bird's gonna sit there, um, and just sits there and does nothing. Now initially the guy thinks it's kind of cool. I mean here's a, you know this beautiful bird that came in. Now a raven is not a, in my opinion, a pretty bird, but you know it fits with the imagery. I read a thing before this in your book where they talked about initially he was gonna have a parrot, but that wouldn't quite have the frightening image to it, right? <laughs> It says, then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure, art, oh, sorry, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. So that, now the raven, this is the famous line, the raven saying nevermore. And this is the first time we see it. And this is going to be, again, one of our gothic elements because we're getting the supernatural. Now, it's not like super like crazy, but it's still a talking bird. Come on, guys. So, and the bird just says nevermore. And that's all it's going to say in the whole poem, to be honest with you. All right. Um, Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculpture bust above his chamber door with such a name as Nevermore. So he kind of jokingly says, wow, I must be really special. I'm, no one else has ever had a bird named Nevermore come and hang out with him. So right now he's still like dealing with his sorrow in kind of a joking manner and things like that. But he's going to start slowly slipping from here on. It says, uh, but the raven sitting lonely on the placid bus spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Now he's thinking here about the girl, that Lenore, that left him. He says, well, even this bird's going to leave me. And the bird says, nevermore, like I'm never going to leave you. Now, of course, Initially, the guy's like thinking this is a good sign that, you know, maybe this is his, the spirit of this girl that he loved come back to be with him. But of course, you know, let's just be honest, that's not going to be it. Startled at the stillness, broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, what it utters is his only stock in store. 
caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of, of never never more so the guy right now is still making sense. He's like, well, maybe it's just that this bird knows one word from the master it had who, you know, met an unhappy end. So right now he's still making sense. But, man, I'm telling you guys, it's coming. The, the, the whoo is about to happen. <laughs> but the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of the bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking. Fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. So now he's going to start overanalyzing. He's going to pull up a chair and check out the bird and think and say, you know, what could he possibly mean by saying nevermore right now? And now this is where we're going to start, you know, the, 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 the breakdown Says this I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease, reclining on the cushioned velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. So he sits there and he keeps looking at the bird, but now look at the, the he went from kind of thinking the bird was kind of cool to listen to the word fiery eyes that burned into his bosom's core. This is getting to be a, a more scary imagery. All right. Um, then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Cloth, O oh, cloth, this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. So this, really, if you're looking for it, this is the stanza where the breakdown occurs, okay? Um, he starts thinking that things are changing physically. The air gets thicker and all that. And he starts talking to the bird, and he basically is suggesting, it sounds like when he says, Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels. He hath sent thee respite, respite, and a pent, which if you look at the bottom, just it's a drug that can relieve sorrow. So he basically thinks the bird has been sent here to help him forget about Lenore but then like just you know again the bird just says only one word he says nevermore it just so happens it always hits right at a point where it makes perfect sense and he says are you here to help me forget her and the bird says nevermore in other words you're never going to forget her that's just not going to happen all right he says then me thought the air grew denser perfume from an I'm sorry we already read that one let's go to the next one prophet said I thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here uh, ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted. Tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. So now he even originally had thought maybe the bird came from heaven to help him. Now he even suggests that it might have come from hell, but he basically begs it, and this is there's one of the two questions that it asks. It asks, is there, is there a balm in Gilead? Which is a famous like uh, reference to a biblical passage. Um, it's, a, it's a song your grandparents probably know. Uh, but it says, your book says in the Bible, it's a healing ointment made in Gilead. So they're basically saying, is there any way to heal this pain? And the bird tells him, no. You're going to be in pain the rest of your life. All right. Uh, last three stanzas. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if... Within the distant uh, Aden, if sh it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, quote the raven, nevermore. So now the guy's asking about whether he'll ever see Lenore again in heaven. And the bird tells him again, no. Uh, which, you know, again, this guy is just distraught, and this is not helping him, all right? You know, the talking bird is not being nice to him. All right. He says, Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. So now he's telling the bird, get out. Get out. I don't want to hear from you anymore. That word you keep saying is driving me crazy. The uh, image you gave me of never seeing this girl again is upsetting me. He says, just get out. And the bird tells him, never more again, meaning I'm never going to leave you. And then up until now, this poem is not even a little bit creepy to me. It's just, you know, it's kind of nonsensical. If we're going to make it a little creepy, though, this last stanza does a good job of at least giving it a little bit of that factor. 
Says, in the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of pals just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadows on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. So now you get this image of the bird still sitting there staring at him. And the, the, the present tense of that makes it a little scarier. You also get this image of the shadow being cast as also a ca shadow cast on this man's soul, which again indicates this, the levels of of distraught he has re reached. That's a weird sentence. Uh, <laughs> how distraught he is, that makes more sense. So uh, to the point where he's basically snapped at this point. So um, that is The Raven, you know. Again, it's a great example of Gothic literature. And really, if we had read the selection the book gives you, The House of Usher, you'd have seen all five of these elements show up in great, in, in, in great detail. But it's really kind of a difficult text for a lot of people to tackle, especially the week before Thanksgiving when I'm originally filming this. So The Raven gives us a lot of the same components. Um, and we're going to talk more about it uh, at a later date about, you know, because I may go back and hit the House of Usher later, but right now we're just going to stay without it. Now, um, be sure that you look at the questions on page 317, questions 1, 2, 3, and 4. These are not questions that I ever give you, and I, I don't assign them because I feel like that's lazy teaching, but they do help un you understand what's going on and what's important in this section, all right? So be sure to look over those. And uh, again, review the elements of what goes into Gothic literature, and because we're going to look at some other things and see if it does or doesn't fit. Okay, I mean we could look at The Devil and Tom Walker and see if that kind of fit in elements and things like that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, again, it's not my favorite by any stretch, but tomorrow or the next video we do, we do get to tackle some of my favorites, and that's Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I, I believe is a brilliant writer, but uh, you know definitely a lot for most people to unpack. So. Anyway, guys, uh, enjoy it. I hope you uh, learned something and got to maybe hear a piece of cultural history here because pe everybody knows of the Raven. I mean, think the Simpsons even did an episode of the Treehouse of Horror where this very poem was read and Bart was the Raven. So, uh, I mean, it's got, it's got a lot of references in our world today. This is, this is definitely a poem that you want to at least have read so you're not out of the conversation if it comes up. So anyway, well, guys, have a wonderful afternoon, and I will talk to you when we get back to talk about Emerson later.